the walls and the ceilings and the towers and all the above do, do in fact speak. And, and, if, and if you happen to be in the tower and you weren't paying attention to the time, but you were in transcribing the inscription that's on the bell up there. Oh, Lord! And it happens to strike the hour as you're standing next to the bell. You think it's loud down here. I can attest it's a little bit louder upstairs. <laughs> Trip will do anything in the course of history. In the course and the cause of history. The um, other thing that I think of is uh, in terms of uh, things of the past that would like to thump at us or to speak to us. Um, one is the crater. And Tripp has been recording the gravestones, and I'm very grateful to him for doing that. Oh, this won't do me any good if we don't have anything to write with. Do we have anything in here to write with? Ah, uh, yes, for the piano. Yes? Great. I should have thought of this, but I didn't. And on neighbor of mine, and, and 
I lived in the traditional African American neighborhood, um, who's now in a nursing home, he used to live right by Morey Field. Yeah. And you know, he used to, he used to tell stories about watching all the burials. And, yeah. yeah. Well, when they created Shiloh Cemetery in 1910, 15, something like that, they moved the stones and and burials associated with the stones. But as we so often did here in Fredericksburg, we did not uh, <coughs> go further than that. So any any cemetery that's been quote moved means you folks whose stones are still standing got to move. We can pass two of those two. Thank you. Diana's personal staff. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Woo! So make sure we know All right. John, so, what was the date again on the closing of the street for the burial? We know it was fenced by 1808. My guess is we had been just disregarding it and doing whatever we wanted in it for quite a while in the in the latter 1700s. And what street do you mean, Princess Anne Street? You no, George, George, George. And just put a friend. This is a, a map the city made in 1808 of, of those streets that people had fenced for their private use. <laughs> that was that was one of them. Was Carolina Street the primary street, downtown street? Sure. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting that the, the church didn't build on the principal street. Well, the it church built up on the height of its lot. Um, and I don't know why, but... Uh, River. Floods. Well, could be. Floods, Floods. sloping yeah. land. Sure. Be. In any case, the, the long and the short of it is that... that um, so we had graves out here, and then we had graves in here. And of course, as you know from our recent archaeology, we found six graves over here in the Market Square. And St. George has reburied those bodies, what, last year, maybe? Two years ago. The uh, year before. Okay. And uh, then in uh, the early 20th century, folks have two handouts up here. In the early 20th century, when they were beginning to put in some of the power, power lines out front, they discovered burials out front in the street, in front of the church. So I think we were fairly messy burials. <laughs> what it boils down to. Um, and so that we've, we've done what we could with moving bodies and graves and markers in the stuff that's gone on ever since. Um, One of the marvelous things is that people keep finding stuff and sending it to those who are interested. Some of you will, may well have already seen. Let's see, where did Jeanette get this? Libby Jacoby sent to Jeanette Cadwallader. It's May 3rd, 1959 picture of Tom Faulkner and the bishop at the laying of the cornerstone right there. A reminder that until 1959, our campus was this building and that building and a much bigger graveyard. So let me pass that around and it's just a, you know folks find stuff it's it's the way that this this uh article about the church in 1906 barbara willis was looking for something else and ran into this two weeks ago and it's a woman who has read more or less everything there is to read about st george's <coughs> finding something new and your plea from your archivist again, like I mentioned last time, if you have any old pictures, especially before McGuire Hall was built, I would sure like to get copies of those pictures. Well, and, and, and Tripp has said before, and let me just repeat it, um, there must be pictures we simply don't know about, mm -hmm. even if they're just snapshots <coughs> from an event in or around the church in early days or stuff you run across in, in some, some other way, why, uh, please, for heaven's sakes, uh, let us know and let us add that. And I can to, scan them so I won't hurt your picture at all. Right. Um, last 
last week I referred to. Folks, there are handouts right here for today's today's class. Bishop, welcome. We're delighted to see you, sir. We'll probably ask you to say a few words on the history of the diocese. Now shut up. <laughs> no, you're about the history of St. George's. That's why I came. <laughs> Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. Um, I referred last week to the little strip of pictures that are there, which are a complete tour of the city in 1881. And I tried to reproduce them for you, and they don't reproduce well. So what I have done is simply taken one and done a few identifications on it. And I'll pass that around. Looking from here toward the most important site, the James Monroe Museum. <laughs> so the joke is I, I, I work at the James Monroe Museum. And all the pictures are on the Mary Washington, the University of Mary Washington internet site. They certainly are. They certainly are. Uh, one of the things that's terribly interesting is to think about the way in which the changes to the interior of the church are essentially uh, changes uh, that reflect our changing view of liturgy in the same way that our thoughts now going on about improvements to the uh, nave and the chancel and the sanctuary reflect those things. We don't know exactly the plan of either of the early buildings. We can surmise we had a very simple wooden 18th century church. It was covered with split clapboarding painted with tar. So. It was not somewhere high up in architecture land, and it undoubtedly had as a principal feature a pulpit, though I'm, I'm probably not something so grand as, say, the pulpit at a quiet church, where fancy stuff can be seen from 20 years after we built. It was big enough, you'll remember it accommodated that peculiar social institution, the private pew. In the 1760s, Fielding Lewis and his partner, Charles Dick, were permitted to build a hanging pew, a private balcony in the wooden church. 